anybody can get up and make their bed. <laughs> you don't, nobody has to really teach you. Uh, there's no complex book about it. I thought it was funny you mentioned Saddam Hussein didn't make his bed right, when you had him right. in captivity. Do bad guys generally not make their beds? <laughs> well, no, I've told people, I said, just because you don't make your bed does not make you a bad person. CEO and co-founder. Yolanda Dell, the founding partner of BBC. Admiral McRaven is an American hero. He was a SEAL for nearly 40 years. He led the Bin Laden raid and trained thousands of our best warriors. His leadership lessons have gone viral, getting millions of views. He's a best-selling author. Learn why so many Americans and people around the world are inspired by this great American leader. Really excited to have Admiral Bill McRaven here with us today. Hey, thanks, Joe. Great to be here. And Admiral, you're a four-star Admiral, commander of the U.S. Special Forces Command. You, uh, you were the former chancellor of the Texas system, I think, for That's 2015 right. and 2018. Yep. And of course, you're a best-selling author. You got all sorts <laughs> of great books, which I've enjoyed reading. Well, thanks. Thanks. Let's start at the beginning of your military career. Tell us, tell us about your motivation to become a Navy SEAL and stay a SEAL for 35 years. Yeah, well, my father uh, was an Air Force officer. Uh, actually, uh, he had played professional football for the Cleveland Rams uh, back in 1938, 1940. Wow. Played for a couple of years and could begin to see the kind of storm clouds of war brewing. So as he tells the story, he and about four other members of the Cleveland Rams, you know, got in a car and drove to California and, and enlisted in the Army Air Corps. Wow. And so dad was a pilot uh, during World War II and then uh, had a 26 year Air Force career. And so, you know, growing up in the military, you know, spending time and being around kind of the greatest generation really kind of helps motivate you. Yeah. And I, I like the camaraderie. I like the sense of patriotism and optimism that the, this kind of greatest generation had. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I grew up, um, you know, watching movies like The Green Beret and uh, reading books on uh, World War II special operations. So it seemed to be kind of a natural transition for me into the special operations community. You know, I've always looked up to, to amazing people in your community. One of the reasons I was actually scared and didn't end up going to West Point for myself is I sometimes wasn't very good with authority as a kid. And I, I thought it was interesting. You were on SEAL Team 6 and you stood up to authority and got fired earlier in your career. Can you tell us what happened with that? Yeah, well, uh, I don't know if it was standing up to authority or there was certainly a disagreement between my boss and I. Uh, but he was the commanding officer. And at the mm -hmm. end of the day, the commanding officer makes the decisions at a, at a command, rightfully so. And uh, he didn't think I was particularly a good fit for the organization. So he kind of relieved me of my command. And essentially, I got fired. Uh, and, you know, I always tell people it's never good to get fired. It's really bad to get fired in the Navy. And it's particularly bad to get fired in the SEAL teams because mm -hmm. everybody knows who you are. And, and, of course, everybody knew that I had been fired. So you, you kind of face this sort of existential uh, problem that, well, do I continue on? Uh, do I decide to go another path? And, uh, and I went home that night after, uh, after he took me away from my job, and I talked to my wife, and, and she said, look, you've never quit at anything in your life. Don't start now. And it was uh, probably the best advice I had in my career. And so I stayed the course. I got hired by uh, another SEAL team, uh, SEAL Team 4, and, uh, and was able to resurrect my career and, and continue on. And more broadly, what's the right time to take a stand against authority? When should you speak up and disagree? And when should you go along? Yeah, and, and I want to be careful about making too much of this in that uh, you know, he was a Navy commander. He was the mm -hmm. commanding officer. Uh, in his eyes, I was a young lieutenant who, again, didn't meet his expectations. Mm -hmm. But I did sense that there were some things at the command that, uh, that didn't seem quite right to me. Uh, so I didn't follow uh, a lot of the guidance I would offer uh, that was kind of being brought down. And, and he and I had a couple of discussions on this. Um, and eventually it was kind of a, you know, a parting of ways. But, but you know, you, you've got to be in a position, I think, uh, in, in frankly any organization to be comfortable speaking truth to power. Good leaders want you to speak truth to power. The, the ones that are afraid to accept uh, honest mm -hmm. feedback, the ones that are afraid to accept criticisms, uh, those are the ones you got to be a little bit careful about. But, uh, but the good leaders that I've been around uh, have said, sure, if you have a concern or a problem, you ought to be free to address it without any sort of retribution. And so, um, you know, this is, it's something I learned at a young age and, uh, and, and tried to incorporate into my leadership style later on, where when I had junior officers, uh, who didn't agree with me or senior, senior enlisted that didn't agree with me, I think they understood 
I was okay with that. Uh, I had thick enough skin. And oh, no, by the way, I wanted to know their concerns because if they've got concerns and I can't address them and I can't answer their questions, yep. then maybe I've got it wrong. And you got to be, you know, uh, a good enough leader to accept that. Well, my team constantly tells you what I'm doing wrong. Sometimes I thought I wish I was in the military. I could like order them around more. Yeah, you know. it doesn't even work that way in the military. You know, like you, everywhere you are, you got to right. hear it. Yeah. Tell us a little more. You know, I think a lot of us look up to sales and the culture there. You have some amazing stories of the discipline and how hard you had to try yeah. in, in your book, Make Your Bed. Like, how does a sale think about solving a difficult problem, either a kinetic or diplomatic problem? How's, how's that? What's that approach teach you? Yeah, you know, I think uh, when you look at a uh, a kinetic problem, let's say, so a, a raid, a, a mission like we would have conducted in Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere else around the world, uh, you know, it, it is really about the depth of the planning. You know, people always see the movies, and you know, you see the movies and you see the seals going out and running the, the great missions, and there's the, the you know the sexiness to the movie. What they don't see is the hours and hours and hours of deliberate planning mm -hmm. that goes into this, because movie makers aren't going to make you know, a picture about a bunch of seals in front of a whiteboard kind of phase diagramming out the plan. But when you've got a, a challenging plan uh, or a challenging mission, you better have a good plan. You better have a plan. You better rehearse it. You better make sure you have all the resources you need to, to conduct it, conduct it safely, uh, and, and bring the, the boys back home. But, uh, but this is also where you lean on experience. So there were a lot of times during Iraq and Afghanistan where we had challenging missions and I would always bring in the men or the women that had the experience, that had seen this before. Because mm -hmm. rarely in warfare, and I would offer rarely in whether it's diplomacy or where, rarely in the corporate world, is there a situation that somebody in your organization hasn't seen before. So you bring them in, you draw upon their experience, and then you have to make the best decision you can. And how does that change in real time? I'm curious to hear. I remember you talked in your books about... One time you had to send three helicopters into yeah. a hostage situation right. and the third helicopter clipped the wall and bar barely yeah. made it. But it sounds like no one no one got killed somehow with no. all these guys with guns running in. Like, <laughs> are, are there new things that happen? And, and how do, these things must be super dynamic. You know, you have to trust the, in this case, the, the men on the battlefield, but, uh, but you have to trust the people that work for you. So in the case of the mission you're talking about, yeah, it was a uh, hostage rescue operation. Um, but every night we were confronting similar missions, whether they're hostage rescues or raids or airstrikes, where things are moving very, very quickly. And as the commander of the unit, you know, you are sitting back in the command center, you are watching these things unfold, you are listening on the radio, you're seeing the bad guys move, you're, you know, you're helping coordinate kind of everything from the medevac to the uh, air support. But on the ground, where the stuff is happening, you have to rely on the ground force commander. You, you know, hopefully you have trained them, you have give, given them the resource to do, to do the job. Now you've got to give them the latitude to do the job. And invariably, you know, not always, but most of the time, because they were experienced enough, because you trusted them enough, because you had given them the tools, they managed to pull the job off and they managed to do it well. Are there times you remember when you guys made a bunch of plans for a bunch of scenarios and something happened that wasn't in the plans? <laughs> always. That, like, what, can you give us an example? Always. Of one? I mean, we always talk about the fact that uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Mm -hmm. It's an old uh, adage in the military. And so, yeah, you've got to have plan A, and plan A never goes according to schedule. So you better have plan B, C, and D. I mean, the bin Laden raid's the perfect example. I mean, we plan for weeks on end on how we were going to approach this target. And of course, the idea was the lead helicopter was going to come in, hover over the courtyard, the guys were going to fast rope into the courtyard and then begin to go from the first floor to the second to the third. The other helicopter was going to come in, it was going to fast rope guys onto the roof so that the seals would come in from top and the seals would come in from the bottom, yep. uh, kind of sealing off the, the bad guys. Well, of course, the first helicopter comes in and one of the things we could not uh, prepare for uh, because we just didn't really have time. We had built a mock-up that had the dimensions of the target in Abadaba, the Bin Laden target. But, of course, we couldn't build the concrete walls. Mm -hmm. What we found was when the first helicopter came in and it hovered, there was an 18-foot-high concrete wall off to the pilot's left. Wow. And the down blast from the helicopter hit that concrete wall and created a vortex, basically a vacuum over the top of the lift uh, of the blades. Mm -hmm. And so the pilot kind of lost lift and then careened off into the uh, what we referred to as the animal pen. Huh. Well, 
that obviously didn't go according to plan. Now the second pilot coming in, he doesn't know exactly what's happened, doesn't know whether they've taken fire, but he decides, hey, I need to move off outside the compound. Now everything we had planned for plan A has all gone you know, south. But the guys had a plan B. They knew what their objectives were. They knew who had to flow in, who had to take which out, it was a bunch of little outer buildings, and who had to go into the, the main complex. So they, they executed plan B, you know, plan C, and plan D. How many guys were there in each helicopter, you can, if you can say? Well, we had about 12 guys in hell, 24 guys on the ground total. And they all landed outside and had to work their way in. Yeah, they were, they were basically, well, one entire helicopter group was actually outside the, you've seen this kind of trapezoid-shaped yeah. uh, compound that we had. So they were all outside that. The other group were in, again, there was a, a second section of the trapezoid-shaped compound that was, in fact, walled off from the compound, the area we needed to get into. So basically, you're right, Joe, they were all outside the main area that they were supposed to be in. How did they get in when there's 18-foot walls? Well, so there were doors, but they had to be blown down. Just so the doors, the doors had to, yeah, the breachers came in, uh, you know, blew the doors down, metal doors that they had to breach to get into the Did area. anything surprise you about, about the thing you found there? Uh, you know, we had, uh, the one thing that we didn't know, um, uh, and again, this will go down as one of the great intelligence um, operations in the history of the CIA, and rightfully so. Of course, we didn't know whether bin Laden was there. But what we also didn't know was if we thought bin Laden was there, which you have to plan as though it is him, mm -hmm. because in the planning, the, the one thing that would be uh, of concern was did they rig with booby traps the compound? Yeah. We had found in Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of times when we went in to hit targets, the targets were rigged. Yeah. So the guys coming in on target, they didn't know. Were the doors booby trapped? Uh, were the walls booby trapped? Believe it or not, uh, in Afghanistan, a lot of times they would put mines in the wall in the wall so Jeez. that as the team lined up against the wall to breach the door it's terrifying they just blow out just yeah. blow it out so so that was one thing we didn't know but it turned out that uh no in fact there were no booby traps that was a, a little surprising but of course you know the courage of the men going on the target they didn't know that going in um but it, I, I think the other thing that surprised me a little bit was um yeah, we assumed that bin Laden would have a, a bug out route, you know, yeah. knowing that sooner or later somebody was going to come. Yeah, you think there's maybe a tunnel or something. Right. And, and we had, uh, we'd looked for that. The intelligence guys had looked for some sort of subterranean tunnel. Uh, again, hard to tell from the intelligence we had. But, uh, but apparently, if he did, we never found it. Uh, and wow. of course, we got to him before he could get away. Amazing. In uh, 2014, you did a really viral commencement speech at UT. And you describe the 10 lessons you learned from SEAL training. Right. And you have this great book, Make Your Bed. And you started, you started it with, if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. <laughs> yeah. Why do you think this resonated with so many people? I mean, millions of people have seen this now and talked about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's over 100 million have uh, watched this video. Um, and, and I'm always flattered and, and, uh, and, and, and a little surprised by it, but in a very pleasant way. But I think the reason it resonates is it is simple. You know, it's not hard to get up every morning and make your bed. And I get uh, a dozen emails every week from people kind of all around the world that say, look, this very simple task has really helped me deal with the, the challenges of the day. Because when you get up and you make your bed, and you, again, you take a little pride in it, then it kind of motivates you to do another task and another and another. And, it's, and there is just something, it's kind of strange to sound, but there's something comforting, there's something orderly about going back into your bedroom and finding the bed made. I, I think it gives people a sense of order in a, in a chaotic life. Um, and it's not hard. Obviously, you know, anybody can get up and make their bed. It, you don't, nobody has to really teach you. Uh, there's no complex book about it. Um, and so I think that's why it has resonated. It is simple, it is powerful, uh, and you know the utility of doing it is has played out time and time again. I thought it was funny you mentioned Saddam Hussein didn't make his bed right, when you had him right. in captivity. Do bad guys generally not make their beds? <laughs> well, no. I've told people I said just because you don't make your bed does not make you a bad person. Uh, but I did have to <laughs> laugh that uh, I would go in, I would go in every day that we had Saddam to check on him to make sure that uh, you know, he was appropriately taken care of. And, and his bed was always kind of rumpled, not made. Did you really go in and not talk to him at yeah. all? Well, what I didn't want to do uh, was, you know, give him a, a platform to engage. And it would frustrate him. I would, I would come into the room, he would get up, and I would always motion to him to take a seat. Um, and I would go talk to him. I always had a, a, a corpsman or a doctor and then a mm -hmm. security guy in the room with him. It was just a small room, probably not much bigger than the one we're in here. Um, 
And, uh, you know, just so I could physically set eyes on him, make sure we were doing what was appropriate in terms of taking care of him. Um, but he would always, and I told my, my guard, my doc, I said, don't engage him in conversation. Yeah. If he starts to talk to you, you just don't engage him. And I know that was hard for the guys, you know, because he would want to talk and, and he would ask questions like, how come El Jefe, you know, he, he knew yeah. I, even though I would, I took off my collar devices, so he didn't, and I had my name tag off. He guessed so who you were. He, he probably figured out when I came in every day and they kind of immediately popped to that yeah. I was somebody important to him. Um, so yeah, we just, uh, you know. Did you, I, I find that whole thing, obviously it's fascinating. Did you, did you guys learn a lot from him? He must've known a lot, even though he's a really bad guy, he must've known a lot about what could work in the country or what was going on in the country or the balances of power? Well, the, there was, uh, early on, there was a period uh, where he was questioned about a lot of things. Captain Spiker, you know, who had mm -hmm. been lost in Desert Storm, uh, which apparently he really didn't know about Captain Spiker. And of course, there were a lot of questions about the weapons of mass destruction, and these sort of things, uh, about, you know, the, uh, the horrible um, chemical attack on the Kurds. So th we, there were some kind of standard questions. Not, not a lot of questions concerning you know, how we could uh, you know, take on the insurgency. Uh, there was, a, again, a short questioning period on things that were of importance to, uh, to the U.S. national leadership and our allies. But then, then after that, uh, we just kind of kept him in the room until I eventually passed him off. And I, I want to ask a sensitive question about Iraq, and it's okay if, sure. it's, if it's not appropriate. No, far away. So, so a company I started, Palantir, played a, played, a, played a role where we especially worked well with some of the special forces right. groups and the SEALs, yeah. and we're really proud of the work we did supporting them. And one of the things they were doing is they were capturing a lot of terrorists, a lot of bad guys, and locking them away. And it seems to me like this has happened a couple of times where you get all the bad guys, you lock them away, and then when we leave, the bad guys escape and become really powerful terrorist groups again. And that, that was always extremely frustrating, for sure. feeling like it helped a little bit, and then it, that happened. Like, how did you feel about that, and are there mistakes we made and that, that we're not going to make again? Because it feels like it happened a little bit again in Afghanistan, too. Every week we would sit down with the leadership in Iraq or Afghanistan, and we would go through, a, again, a legal proceeding with the lawyers. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you, you uh, captured this person. This person's been incarcerated for X number of months. Um, he's been a good citizen. You know, so, but where there were um, detainees that we held that we thought were, should never be released, uh, in the entire time I was in Iraq, we certainly didn't release them. Uh, some of them went to um, went to Guantanamo. Uh, now, is that to say that you know at some point in time uh, a lot of bad guys got back out into the uh, into Iraq and Afghanistan? Sure, yes, they did. Uh, and there, you know, there's no denying that. But some of the really really hardcore guys, uh, you know, we sent off to Guantanamo. And it's interesting. You said obviously we're a country of laws. You had rules. Right. There's lawyers. There's bureaucrats. Uh, I think we're all proud of the fact that we're a country of laws. At the same time, there's natural tension between too many rules and bureaucrats and right. common sense. Like, where are we on that spectrum? Have we gone too far where, there, where there's too many lawyers slowing things down sometimes? You need to balance it back out, or where would you say we are? Yeah, in the military? Yeah, in the military. Yeah, well, some of these I, you operations. Know, I will tell you, within the special operations community, I was always really pretty content with the rules of engagement and, and uh, the laws we had to follow. One, as the guy making the final decision on the military use of force— when I say the final decision, uniform guy. Uh, now again, Secretary of Defense, President of the United States, uh, would uh, depend upon what the mission was, they were the final authority. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm the uniform guy making the decision to capture or kill a bad guy. And, um, and so I wanted to make sure, you know, that I'm doing things that are legally appropriate, yeah. things that are, you know, within the, you know, the right sense of who we are as Americans. Uh, you don't want to go down that dark path where you convince yourself that the ends justify the means. If you do that, that path yeah. gets really small and really dark real fast. So, uh, no, I, I never really felt that we were constrained. I mean, every time we had a bad guy uh, that we thought we needed to go capture, you really um, we were always in a position to do that, and we did it a lot. Now, you've got to make the case uh, to the leadership, why this individual's bad, why you think you need to try to capture him. Um, and, and that was a good process for us. So no, I, I never really felt constrained by it. Well, that's great to hear. Yeah. I want to ask you about another book you wrote called The Harrow Code. And okay. you focus on, you focus on the classical virtues, you know, right. temperance, prudence, fortitude, and my favorite courage. Yeah. Uh, you, these virtues have become a little bit old fashioned, but how do we revive them? And how do we bring these back into the core of our civilization? Yeah, you know, I, I think we just don't spend enough time talking about the people that have these virtues. And, you know, in, in the Hero Code, uh, when I'm thinking about, you know, what are the kind of the 10 
virtues or qualities that I wanted to identify. Uh, interestingly enough, I actually had to go back and say, well, what is a hero? You know, we tend to call everybody heroes nowadays. And so I actually grappled with what is a hero? And then I decided, well, maybe I should go to the dictionary. Maybe the dictionary will help. And sure enough, the dictionary said, a hero is someone we admire for their noble qualities. And I like that definition. I said, I got it. Noble qualities. Okay, now let's outline the noble qualities. And there's a quote from Churchill, I think, in, that's in the book, and I'm paraphrasing here a little bit, but it, something to the effect that, you know, courage is the most important of the qualities because it guarantees all the rest. Mm. The point being, if you don't have courage and, and, and you, you're not prepared to defend the other qualities, whether it's forgiveness or, you know, sacrifice, or the, then those qualities won't exist. You mm. have to find men and women that are courageous. Mm -hmm. And, of course, my first story uh, is about uh, Lieutenant Ashley White, who was part of the cultural support team in Afghanistan. Remarkable young woman who signed up early to be part of these teams that went with my Rangers and SEALs into combat. Um, and, uh, and from everything I know, she was a remarkable lady. And every day, you know, she'd strap on her gear and uh, hop on that helicopter and go out on a mission. And unfortunately, in 2011, she was killed on a, on a mission with a couple of Rangers. But as I began to kind of find out more and more about her story, it was clear to me that she exemplified courage. And, and I found when I left the military, I think I say this in the book, you know, you're in the military and you think that these qualities of courage and sacrifice are, mm -hmm. are only unique to the military or the first responders, and you find out that's not true. Yeah. I mean, the fact of the matter is, everywhere I went when I was the chancellor of the University of Texas system, everywhere I've been since then, you see great Americans that have tremendous courage, that are sacrificing a lot. Certainly during COVID, you saw it with the, with the healthcare workers. But, you know, uh, Hurricane Harvey, uh, I was chancellor when Hurricane Harvey hit, and you saw the people of Houston and the surrounding areas kind of come together and do things that were incredibly courageous and, and, and had all the qualities that, and, and, you know, that we think of, and yet they never served in the military. They weren't first responders. So, so I think those qualities are out there, Joe. I just think we don't we don't spend enough time. We tend to look at all the bad things today and we highlight the negative aspects of our mm. culture when sometimes we need to focus on the positive. And you spend more time highlighting real, real heroes and real, real right. positive values. Yeah, and there are a lot of them out there. It does feel like a, the greatest generation, as you mentioned, those, those little boys and girls grew up with heroes in the past and they right. heard about courage a little more maybe. I, I do think that there was, uh, you know, again, social media has, has disrupted a lot of how we view ourselves, I think. Um, we, again, because uh, we tend to highlight the bad things because they seem to get more clicks, um, we forget that there's an awful lot of good going on out there. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm convinced that it is out there and out there in abundance. I agree. But, but uh, spe speaking of challenging things, uh, yep. state of the military, a recent study showed about 80% of young Americans would not qualify for military right. service right now. What's happening in our culture around that, and how, how do we fix that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and you're right, the, the recruiting numbers are down uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, there is this concern about the fitness of young men and women coming up. And, uh, you know, it, it's everything from the fitness, uh, they're, they're overweight, uh, you know, drug abuse, a lot of these sorts of things. Um, so it is harder to recruit. And uh, I'm not sure whether it's 80%, but it's a high number. But also during the pandemic, uh, the recruiters who normally recruit out of high school, of course, they were not able to have access to the high schools because high schools were shut down during the pandemic. So that affected the, the mm. pipeline. Um, you know, there's this concern about wokeness. Um, but I will tell you that when a survey has been done regarding, you know, talking to the young kids, why did you join? Where did wokeness fall out? Yeah, it was not high on their concerns. And I will tell you in my discussions with, uh, you know, with sailors and soldier sailors, airmen, marines, you know, again, I think it's getting blown out of proportion. It's not to say we, we don't need to be cognizant of it, um, but it doesn't permeate the military the way, you know, some people seem to imply that it does. That's good to hear. You know, in the tech ecosystem, 20-year-olds have built some of our country's biggest companies. Right. You kind of let us be uh, responsible leaders and adults at a yep. very, very young <laughs> age there, which is why it was very attractive to me. I started Palantir when I was 21. And our military takes decades to rise up yeah. and, and to have power. 
Does the military need to rethink how it promotes talent or gives responsibility to young people? Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a great question, uh, Joe, because, uh, and, and certainly as I have left the military and spent a little bit more time in the, in the corporate world, uh, to your point, you know, I've, I've been exposed to these incredible young men and women, yourself included, uh, that at a very young age have just done phenomenal things. So, yes, so we've got to figure out a way to recognize talent early and, and, and figure out how it, it moves quicker through the chain of command. I feel, I feel like in the 19th century, that was something that happened all the time. You'd get the opportunity and you'd be 26 and you'd be right. in charge of things. And it seems like it's harder now than it used to be. It, it is. I mean, there's a, a structure, of course, to the military. And the structure is important to some degree because experience is important. And uh, so if you come in at 21 and you're incredibly bright, yes, you may be able to, to, uh, to build a tech platform, but if you haven't spent years, you know, sailing around the world or, you know, uh, defending, you know, the terrain of the United States or you haven't been in these leadership positions, then that is a little bit more challenging. Well, now that I'm 40, I agree with you. It's very, <laughs> it's very important. But, but, but I don't disagree with you. That, and in fact, the military has, uh, you know, we've been looking at a lot of ways to recruit, uh, you know, great young men and women from the tech world to kind of help uh, the military deal with some of the tech challenges and, and that, that they're dealing with. So. You know, I do think we need to continue to figure out ways to, you know, uh, advance people a little quicker than we've been doing in the in the past. And I want to ask about the military in, in general. This is a broader question, but you served in the Gulf War, which was one of mm -hmm. probably one of the most stunning examples of America's military superiority. And nowadays, though, you know, Christian Bros's book Kill Chain, for example, they talk about these war games of U.S. versus China. And it's, the, you know, the, their games anyway, the U.S. is losing in certain co contexts. It's not doing as well in certain contexts. Is the, situ is the situation dire? How, how do we get better? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, you, you got to be a little bit careful about the context. So obviously, Gulf War I against uh, Saddam and the uh, Iraqis, they're not the Chinese military. It wasn't right? a real adversary. Not, not, I mean, they were, it's not that they were, I, I mean, it was not an easy military, but, it, but it's not the Chinese military, right? Yep. I mean, the Chinese military is 2.3 million people. Uh, they've got pretty advanced technology. Um, so in terms of uh, the quality of the military, I, I would tell you I still think uh, that the military that you see today is probably the finest military in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. And I say that uh, because if you think about the history of the world and you think about well, the Roman legions, for example. Well, the Roman legions, a lot of them were farmers until they were recruited into the legion, and maybe they fought for a year and a half. You think about the great armies in history, and you tend to think of them as long-standing armies, where in reality, most of the men that fought in those armies kind of came in, fought for a while, and then went back to, to home. You think about the generation after 9-11, most of the guys I know fought for 20 years. And when you have 20 years of combat experience under your belt, you get pretty good. You get pretty good. And so, yes, we have, we have new soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines coming in that haven't had the experience of 9-11. Uh, but you still have the preponderance of force in the military across the board has been around for the last 20 years. This is when we hear about Caesar's hardened legions. Those are the guys who fought for 10 or 15 right. years. They knew what they were doing at that they point. They knew what they were doing. Um, and, but again, the percentage of those that were part of Caesar's legion was small relative to the size of the you know, entire uh, Roman army. So, uh, but in our case, certainly in the special operations community, I mean, most of these guys have been there for a long time and they're really good. And so when, when we think about the Chinese, and I think the Chinese are thinking about this too, they realize they haven't fought a war since the 40s. So they need to be careful if they think that uh, the technology alone is going to put them in a superior position. Uh, one, our technology, absolutely the finest in the world with maybe one or two exceptions. Um, but our, our soldiers and our sailors, they're none better. Are, are there things we should be doing differently that, that in, in terms of our innovation world there? Or are you, so you're, you're feeling pretty confident overall where we are right now? Well, you can never feel overconfident. Uh, I mean, you, you always have to assume that the enemy's better than you are. Uh, you never want to underestimate the enemy. And again, let me qualify that. I'm not saying China's the enemy. And in fact, if it were up to me, I would work very hard not to make China the enemy. Uh, let China be a competitor. Uh, but what we don't need is we don't need China to be an adversary. Mm. Um, so, but, but as you begin to think about potential conflicts in the future, um, you have to think about near-peer competitors. 
And you never want to be comfortable that your technology or your soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines are good enough. Mm -hmm. You always want them to be better. So when you look at hypersonic missiles out there, we're still struggling with a little bit of hypersonic technology. So we need to improve that, mm -hmm. right? We need to have some sort of technological leap in command and control systems, yep. in soldier systems. We need to continue to improve the quality of our human beings and how we protect them and how we train them. Um, you never want to be comfortable with where you are. If you do that, then uh, then, then you're probably going to lose the next oh, fight. Agreed. My friends and I are working on a few of those things. <laughs> oh, good. I, I, uh, I know, you, I know you're, you're very helpful as a leader in these areas, too. Ch changing gears a little bit, what sure. surprised you most about Russia and Ukraine, about Russia's failures attacking Ukraine? Is this what you, you expected? And there was yeah, some it's, different... it's, it's definitely not what I expected. Um, you know, we've been watching the Russian modernization program over the last 10 or 15 years, you know, and so, I mean, they, they went from the, you know, T-72, T-80, T-90 tank. They've modernized their... Uh, aviation fleet and, and 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 everything else. I mean, we saw this modernization program occurring, but they failed to modernize two things: their soldiers and their tactics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the in the Allied in the Western militaries, we do you know a combined operations. So I mean, combined arms operations. This idea that you have an objective. And you know you'll start with an artillery barrage uh, that'll be you know followed by an airstrike that'll be followed by armor moving in that'll be followed by infantry, but it's all synchronized, and it is the synchronization of the combined arms that gives you uh, kind of the the power on that particular target, if you mm -hmm. will. Well, as we began to see the Russians in their first advance on Kiev, you know we were stunned by you know there'd be an artillery barrage and then everything would go on and then the then the tanks would kind of slowly roll in, and then maybe at some point in time, infantry would come in, but maybe not supported by close air support. It really wasn't a synchronized or professional uh, military that we thought it was going to be. It seemed like their their blitzkrieg got way ahead, and the supply lines got cut Absolute, off. Absolutely, and supply mess. lines. You know, there's an old saying that you know, uh, uh, amateurs talk tactics, professionals talk logistics. A lot of truth in that. If you can't supply an army. Uh, you're not going to be able to fight as an army. So you're right, Joe. They they didn't have their supply system set up. Their command and control systems were not very good. Of course, a lot of their generals had to come to, come to the front lines, and they were, and, and they were uh, eliminated on the front lines uh, because their command and control systems weren't good. So, yeah, we I think we were taken by surprise about how ineffective the Russian military was and, of course, how effective the Ukrainian uh, army has been. And uh, you know, you can attribute a lot of that to the leadership of President Zelensky. He has done the three things every, you know, a wartime leader needs to do. He has been courageous. Uh, he has got great stamina. You think about, he's probably getting, you know, 20, he's probably getting four hours sleep a night, having 20 hour days. He knows that people are always trying to target him. He's out on the front lines when he can be. I mean, that, that takes a lot of stamina. And then he has been able to communicate, you know, this war to the world. And the communication has been very simple. If you're on the side of Ukraine, you're on the side of good. If you're on the side of Russia, you're on the side of evil. That's it. That's the only message you need to, to have out there. He's done a great job. And he's done a great job, yeah. And we, we have a few of our companies and our friends' companies like Starlink and Palantir right. have been involved. And I guess I guess they've been helping him target some of these guys. I'm a little bit scared to talk too much about it in yeah. public <laughs> for, for these things. You know, we talked a little bit about military history. Yep. Uh, you know, I was obviously really into the classics, and you know, I have some old Gladius swords in the back. <laughs> Do you, are, are you familiar with? There's a sword that was the it was the last sword designed for the U.S. Army before they stopped designing new swords. Did you know this one? Is actually, actually brought it. I thought you might. Well, let me take a look. Not just the army, I think, actually. I think it's for, for both. Have you oh seen this one? Goodness, I have not. I thought this was fun. This is <laughs> So you know, you'll know the name of the guy who designed it. He was a general in World War II, but he built this in 1913, 1914. It was Lieutenant Patton, actually. Said, you said <laughs> you heard about, about that? that? Isn't that cool? I think I've heard of Lieutenant Patton. You think about her? Yeah, I think he turned out okay. Isn't that cool? I thought that was neat. So that this, is but this incredible. Is a, apparently, it's the last. I, I'm not allowed to design swords. They won't give me money for it anymore. <laughs> I have to do other weapons now uh, and, and, and defense things. But I thought I thought you'd appreciate. Well, look at that thing. handguard. Is, Isn't that cool? Uh, that like, is impressive. It's pretty well, yeah. pretty well done. You, you never carried anything like this in the. Well, in actually, battle? I do. The, the Navy. Uh, I have a sword, uh, and in fact, the Navy is very big uh, when we do change of commands. Uh, kind of prior to 9/11, more you were required as naval officer at the rank of lieutenant commander to have a sword, huh. uh, and so I've had a sword actually since I was a midshipman. Uh, which was presented to me when I was the battalion commander, and I carried that sword throughout my career. And, uh, and yeah, so surprisingly enough, 
Navy guys always carry swords in their change of command. Did you or one of your friends ever use one? Never had to use it. No, it's <laughs> That's probably, it's probably for the best. Yeah, probably for the best. It wasn't very sharp. So, you know, we started American Optimist to push back against a lot of the pessimism and cynicism yeah. we're seeing in our society. Uh, what makes you optimistic for the future of our nation? What would you tell young people who are, who are negative on our future? Yeah, well, here's what I'll tell you. I'm the biggest fan of the millennials and the Gen Z that you'll ever meet. And that surprises a lot of people because there is this narrative out there that the millennials and the Gen Z are these soft, entitled little snowflakes. Well, then I'm quick to point out you've never seen them in a firefight in Afghanistan or going to the University of Texas to make a better life for themselves. I love this young generation because I, I see in them a difference that is, is going to help the United States and, and probably the world. This generation um, believes they can do anything. And, and frankly, you're a, you're a prime example of that. You know, my generation, for the most part, I think we fell in line with our parents. If our parents were in the military, we were going to be in the military. If our parents were lawyers, we were going to be lawyers. So there was a little bit of this idea that we are going to follow in the footsteps of our parents or grandparents. But this new generation believes that, hey, I can go do anything I want to do. And that's great. That, that, that entrepreneurial spirit, I think, is really what is going to bring us new technology and mRNA and all the things that can solve a lot of the difficult problems in the world. I love the fact that this uh, generation really um, believes and cherishes their friendships in a way that, I mean, I like to think I've got great friends and, and, I, and those friends are important to me. But I also think that the nature of social media is such that this generation can keep in touch with their friends in a way that my generation couldn't. Hmm. Uh, you know, we didn't, if, if you moved away from a, an area, you had to send letters and, uh, you know, a snail mail. And then after a while, you people just touch. stopped sending, you, you lost touch with people. Well, this generation, I mean, my, I look at my kids, they're still, you know, talking every day to kids that they knew when they were five and six years old. Uh, and so these friendships matter. And this generation also mobilizes when they see something they think isn't right. Yeah. I don't agree with everything they mobilize on, but I give them props for, hey, if you see something yeah. you don't think is right, go do something. Go do something about it, right. And, and what advice would you give to young people who aspire to be leaders, whether in the military or in yeah. civilian life? Yeah, there's, I think there's one skill that is underrated as a leader, and that's hard work. At the end of the day, uh, I've been around incredibly talented men and women who never went very far because they, uh, they didn't work as hard as some other people did. And, uh, and yet I've seen people with lesser talent go further because they're prepared to work hard. And, and work hard, this encompasses a lot. It means you get in early. It means you listen to the people that have been doing this for a long time. It means that you work hard all day long and you stay late and you come in on the weekends and you mm -hmm. do whatever you have to do to learn the business, to build the connections, uh, to show the men and women that work for you or with you that you're a serious professional. And that will allow you to move up the leadership chain uh, if people know that you know, uh, you're gonna work hard on their behalf. Amazing. Uh, I love it. Admiral Bill McRaven, you're a great American. Thanks for joining oh, us. Thanks very much, Joe. Great to be here.